It's with enthusiasm and great curiosity that Kim organizes his scuba gear in preparation to plunge into the water. Let's join him now on the lake bottom. You can see, you can see how you've got these big logs and right next to the log is where that fish has its bed. And just like the rocks, you can see how the wood is encapsulated with zebra mussels as well. Taking into consideration that most of the hard structures smallmouth fan their beds beside are coated with colonies of sharp zebra mussels, that, along with the jaggedness of the rocky bottom, you can see why it's advantageous to use an abrasive resistant fishing line like Seaguar fluorocarbon. You don't want to break off fighting one of those giants. There's so many big smallmouth here in Indian River. Big, solid, stocky smallmouth. The Indian River lakes are just phenomenal. With that said, I am, however, baffled by my observations and a bit concerned. We're catching these beautiful, heavy adult smallmouths, but not catching any smaller sized bass. What concerns me even more is, while underwater the last few years here in Indian River, I haven't seen any either. Every bass I've encountered underwater here is the same size footballs I've been catching. It makes me wonder, have I just been looking in the wrong places for small fish? Or am I witnessing an issue with yearly recruitment? You've probably already noticed the abundance of round gobies infesting these rocky nests. But what's increasingly worrisome is the noticeable lack of concern on the parental male's part. Typically, the guarding smallmouths frantically chase off the intruders, but all the bass I observed here on these nests seem as though they've grown accustomed to the presence of round gobies and for the most part are simply ignoring the threat. Perhaps they've been pestered to the point they've given up defending the nest from these egg predators. Yet they don't appear to be exhausted. Another thought is, could it be the size of the gobies? The observable goby population throughout this lake is now predominantly small, only a couple inches long, and can conceal themselves within the rocky crevices of the nest. Watch closely and you'll see them gulping up the eggs. I think it's a wise assumption that the larger gobies have been eaten because the bass readily attack a larger lure when it encroaches on the nest. There's no doubt that the adult smallmouth have been living high on the hog, gorging themselves with these prolific bait fish. And the smallmouths have grown to record proportions since. Yet on the other side of the coin, just how successful has the spawn been the last few years? As you can see, the gobies are indeed a threat, but keep in mind that several factors come into play that affect the spawn and smallmouth recruitment. As I've documented in the past on other lakes, the nests here in Indian River that were fanned on a softer marl bottom did not harbor many gobies at all and may very well be the most successful beds for the smallmouth's brood. One way to gauge and monitor smallmouth recruitment is to conduct fall fingerling studies. However, unlike Lake St. Clair, I'm told that the Michigan DNR does not have the funding nor the manpower in the Indian River area to conduct these studies. So we all want to keep our eyes open and I'll continue sharing my underwater observations. We don't want to jump to conclusions, but when you're not seeing other year classes, it does make you wonder as to what the bass population will be at Burton Mullet in years to come.